Plus One Forward, the podcast powered by the Apocalypse, where we talk about tabletop role-playing games using or inspired by the Apocalypse Engine. I'm your MC, Rich, and I'm joined by my guest, Marissa Kelly of Magpie Games. Hey, Marissa, welcome to the show. Hello, thank you for having me. I have to ask right away, you, you've got Bluebeard Pride and, and Apillion, you are big time into the PBTA game, so i got to know, how long have you been playing them? I've been playing, that's a good question, <laughs> I've been playing them since probably 2011 or late 2011, 2012, yeah. Oh, wow. What was your gateway? What was the first game you played? My first game was Apocalypse World. So. Yes, yes, okay, okay. <laughs> and here's the bonus question. Do you remember what your first playbook was? Oh, man. I want to say it was the Hocus. Whoa, that is that is a crazy one to start with. Very cool, <laughs> very cool. Were you one of the Hocuses where your, the crowd controlled you, your cult controlled you? Or, or oh, I didn't you? think so. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's but of great. course. <laughs> awesome. Well, let's uh, jump in and read a sitch. Excellent. Read a sitch. All right, Marissa. Now, I last saw you at Origins this year, 2016, and you were running Urban Shadows like crazy at Games on Demand, which blows my mind because Urban Shadows, like Apocalypse World and a lot of the other games, are very, like, network relationship heavy and and i always feel like those games pay off at like the five or six game marks Mm -hmm. i gotta know how is it that you run pbta games as one shots tell me the secret come on dish dish i need this (laughs) well uh you're not wrong i definitely think they pay out after a long grind but i find that out of all the uh PBTA games, Urban Shadows is particularly supportive for me as a GM. I have all these tools to tie in characters together. I can create a killer first session with NPCs and conflicts and all the fun, awesome stuff you need. My first step is probably to set expectations. I just tell everyone the structure of what's going to happen, what I need from them, and how it's going to end. So something like... Wait, wait, well, hold on, hold on. <laughs> You're going to tell them how it's going to end? Like you lead off with how it's going to end? How the session is going to end. So I will oh, really? say something like... Well, first I'll say this is what Urban Shadows is about. Hopefully you're at this table <laughs> and you want to <laughs> play this kind of game. Just so we're on the, all on the same page. And then I'll go into something a little more specific. Like this is a one-shot with five players, so we're going to have to share spotlight quite a bit. Try to find ways into each other's stories and scenes. Uh, Don't wander off alone because we won't get to you as much. And uh, try and get everyone together. Then as far as going to the the ending, I tell them the outline of the whole one shot. So I'll be like, first we do character creation. Then we take a 10 minute break. We come back and play the game. And because it's hard to resolve all this crazy bullshit that we're going to put together, I want to leave time for us to go around the table and do epilogues. So each of your characters gets to have one say in something either you did right in the moment or what you do way down the line. But overall, I think success of my one shots is generally to treat character creation like part of the game. So I don't actually do pre-gens. Okay. I ask a ton of leading questions during this part, and I have players excited what everyone else is contributing and while they're sharing, it's easy to see that they're creating a whole world rather than just a character. So I'll ask things about the world, not just about their character's hair color or whatever. Okay, well. <laughs> all right, fine. If you don't care about hair color, I guess. <laughs> I mean, it's not on the playbook, so. <laughs> so do you come in with some kind of loose idea for a plot? Like, I'm going to push towards a fight or maybe a, a like a, a faction versus faction thing? Uh, do you have any ideas when you come to the table? Not when it comes to the table. I do generally take out certain playbooks, like uh, I'll take out the Oracle because it's very much a make-your-own-trouble playbook that pays mm-hmm. out over the long run. Generally, I tell people that if they're going to play the vampire, that it's mostly going to be flavor, and a lot of your main moves aren't going to be touched on. But it's awesome, and so I leave it in. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Overall, I don't come with any story prepared. I do the start of session move before we take our break. And basically, for those who aren't familiar, you're rolling on a rumor that you've heard in the game. So that sort of just sets the tone and gives me a whole lot of fodder. 
And what I do tweak about that is that I have every player add on to something that the one before them said. So that keeps the story really tight. Nice. And then I have a whole 10 minutes for that break to look over and pick an opening scene that will get the ball rolling and include everyone at the table in some way. And when I'm in a doubt, I ask leading questions. If you don't know why the Fae would be at the Vampire's Haven, I just ask them. Neat. So they're a little improv but it sounds like you you let them feed you a lot of those plots during character creation. That's smart. Okay, yeah, cool. definitely. Cool. How much do debts get used in that one shot? Is that a, a frequent hit? Are people hitting that, that pellet bar, as it were? It's not frequent, but I do in my establishing what the game's going to be like. I tell them that these are debts, this is why they're used, and you're going to have to use them to get some of what you want. So I put it in the player's hands to call on them because I don't actually bring in a whole bunch of NPCs. I just have like key NPCs that are tied to the plot that they may want to interact with. Now, what about moves? Do you, when you run Urban Shadows, do you look to pull, like, are you looking to teach those moves to the players, or do you let the fiction just flow, and if you see a move, you'll you'll insert yourself? Like, do you lead people to the move, or do you wait for it to pop up? I generally wait for it to pop up. I tell, again, I tell the players, this is how the structure of the game works. You tell me what cool thing you're doing, and if it triggers a move, we roll. Um, and I also tell them if they see some a move that I may have missed, that is triggered um, to let me know because we want to see that uncertainty play out. Um, and uh, overall, I just tell them to go uh, and barf forth some awesomeness and it works out for the most part. <laughs> so I, I generally, as the GM take on a lot of that uh, and don't leave it to my players because it can be kind of intimidating in a one shot. Well, cool. Thanks Marissa for schooling me on that. I really appreciate it. <laughs> I'd like to open my brain up to this Apillion game. Do you have a minute to tell me about that? Of course. Open your brain. Basically, you're playing uh, dragons in a dragon-centric world. Uh, you're young drakes growing up, trying to help other dragons overcome their problems. And there's a growing darkness in the world that you're trying to investigate and rid uh, Dragonia of. So it's a little bit like Spyro meets My Little Pony. I was a fan of Spyro back in the day. Yeah, me too. <laughs> How do you model dragons with the with the mechanics from the Apocalypse Engine? I mean, what what are the mechanics that are different in Apillion? Well, uh, like PBTA, I moves, agendas, and principles and threats are all the core of Apillion, but each of them is tailored to work specifically to make playing drakes who are growing up in Dragonia interesting and fun. So basically, you're going to have all different moves, all different playbooks. They're, you know, inspired by other PBTA games, but, you know, ultimately, you aren't really going to see the exact same of anything, because I just didn't feel that it really would transfer over very well for having Apocalypse World uh, <laughs> moves in <laughs> as playing Baby Dragons trying to help people. Wait a second. You mean seize by force? Isn't I can't seize by force with my dragon claws? Not exactly. <laughs> no, not exactly. Well, what is your favorite move and why? I would have to say moon magic is my favorite move. There's just beautiful and imaginative ways that players use it at the table. Always makes the game way more satisfying. It is a special move in that it... Is one of the only moves that defuses things rather than snowballing completely. So it's a nice way to end a little episode of your game. And obviously it still snowballs, but it's just a nice way to solve certain problems that dragons otherwise might not be able to. What is the moon magic move? Yeah, so when you call upon the magic of the moons, you roll plus friendship gems returned. And on a 10 plus, uh, apply both. On a 7 and 9, pick one. The magic is exceptionally powerful, and the magic remains within your control. On a miss, the moons act as they will without your guidance. So moon magic is going to be described by the player. So I'll ask them, what does that look like mm -hmm. when you're calling upon the moons? Like from moment one, what does it look like for you to commune that way? And what does it look like as the magic is actually happening and taking place? And then I get to sort of expound on that and explain what it means if it's exceptionally powerful or remains in their control. So it's fun for me to sort of take their lead and then fly with it. 
Nice fly with it. That's <laughs> clever, Marissa. Good one. I'm the one who does the bad puns. I'm not sure if you got the notes. Yeah, sorry about that. I mean, it's definitely okay. it there. We'll let it, we'll, uh, we'll let it go. <laughs> let it go. All right. We don't want to be dragging you around here. Okay. <laughs> that was that was that was worse. I just that was worse. worse. I'm proud. Of, yeah. <laughs> okay. So Apelion's an all ages game, right? Do you see a lot of younger and older people playing at the same table? Yeah, actually, that's my favorite table composition, if you will. I feel like the older people at the table get to sort of model what good table behavior is. Like, oh, let's not talk now. It's so and so's turn. You know, wait your turn or you know, now it's time to roll dice, just the formality of it or helping them read or add if they're really young. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And the kids actually get to model what like real creativity looks like to a lot of adults (laughs) because the (laughs) things that come out of their mouths, I, I don't generally hear from, from many adults. It's super cool and super out there and very much more in keeping of dragons living in a world that never had human influence. Yeah. That's, that's, Dragonia and everything. Yeah, that's that's really cool. You've gotten me pretty excited about this now, Marissa. Would you be interested in maybe running me through a, a quick little sample, a taste of a pillion? Let's do it. It is time to act under fire. Marissa, I am ready. I have I have a character name, but you're gonna have to help me out a little bit with my dragon creation here. I want to play Plus Sinistar. Awesome. I I understand I have a few choices here. Yes, you can either be a nature adept with wild speech. That means you can talk to the beasts of Dragonia. You can be an academic with a field of expertise. This means you have a tome that grants you extra fancy knowledge. Or you can be the daredevil with a little crazy beast companion that loves you unconditionally. Oh, wow. I think a beast companion sounds amazing. I will choose the Daredevil for Plus Sinistar. Awesome. So let's talk a little bit about your beast companion. In Apillion, the beasts of Dragonia are all comprised of different animals sort of all pushed together into one thing. Mm-hmm. So you might have a monkey bear creature and you might call it a bearkey. <laughs> or uh, something like that. So it's a little like Avatar Last Airbender, if you've ever seen that. It has some cuteness there. I love the combo animals from Avatar. Now I'm, I'm like racking my brains yeah. of all the amazing Avatar the Last Airbender creatures there were. There was like everything mixed with a bear, so you like let off with the, the monkey bear. Oh, Well, man, and since see. you're little, we can make it little animals all mixed together too. Little animals? mixed all together um oh gosh how about like a a a, a bat wolf yeah that Is sounds that cool? good yeah all what right. do you want to call it is it a bolf a bolf it's a bolf <laughs> i love it awesome and what's your bolf's name oh um i think that my bolf's name is um flitter awesome so you also get some fun things that you would get to pick with your beast companion but since we're we're doing this quick. We're going to just, we're doing it live. So <laughs> let's just All right. go with the uh, flitter. You're, you're both. And plus Sinisar is ready to rock with a plus a negative one charm, plus two courage and a um, plus zero cunning. Okay. This is rare. Normally the plusies of different worlds always have a plus one, but oh. I will because I'm a daredevil. <laughs> a minus one plus two plus zero is what plus Sinistar has. That sounds exciting. Previously on Apillion, the clutch was asked by the council to go to one of the desert islands on the archipelago and investigate why the shipment of cotton honey from the Buzzle Bun Hive has been delayed. Especially the organizer of the second day of the Moonbeam Festival is very concerned about getting this delivery as soon as possible. You make your way to the top of the dune. The sand beneath your talons and paws is mixed in with a lovely smelling sugar. As you finally reach the top, you look down and see a valley of buzzle bun holes leading down into their hive. So buzzle buns, as you might ex- already know, it are little bumblebees, bunnies, creatures that bounce and flitter, and they have a little fuzzy butt with a stinger, 
and uh, they sort of bounce slash fly, and they're the ones who make the cotton honey that you are missing. The buzzle bun cotton honey, we eat it or we use it to make clothes? Oh, you tell me. For? What do you think the Dragonia th uses cotton honey for? I think we use it for edible cloaks. Oh, that sounds great. Yeah. Okay. So we need a whole bunch of these cloaks made before the festival starts, and uh, they're already behind schedule. And buzzle buns are intelligent. They speak. Like we negotiated some kind of arrangement so, and traded for it? No, we mostly just... They're kind of like bees, and you get there, you sort of harvest the cotton honey and take it back. Um, you've heard your friend, uh, Tachiro, the nature adept, knows a little bit about how to talk to buzzle buns uh, because they are a rare gift as the nature adept to talk to animals. But you have never talked to a beast before. Uh, you communicate very well with Flitter, but, you know, that's special. Right. I want to go see uh, Hachiro then. I, I think that if I can talk to Hachiro, maybe we can have a little communication with the Buzzle Bun, see why we're behind. Uh, Hachiro's here with you and say, well, gestures their wing down upon the, the dune. Dre says, you know, I'm really looking forward to tasting this, so I think we should just go down there and 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 just just stick our heads in and see what's going on. Oh, well, that sounds amazing, Atiro. Uh, so let's go. I, I will f float on down there. I'm a daredevil, right? Yeah. So I have to... Are you going to rush rush down there without knowing what's going on? Come on, Flitter. <laughs> You're going to uh, wait yeah, we'll, for them we'll to catch swoop up? swoop on down. Great. So I think you're actually acting despite danger here because you don't know what you're rushing into at the moment. You're just going to go down and dive into a buzzle bun hole. I think that sounds great to me. All right. So I roll 2d6. And what stat goes with that? It's going to be courage. Well, I'm pretty courageous at a plus two. Yeah, you are. All right. Oh, my goodness. I rolled a five plus two, a seven. Awesome. Mixed success. On a seven and nine, you fumble, stumble, or embarrass yourself. I will offer you a worse outcome, a hard bargain, or an ugly choice. As you're careening towards uh, one of the buzzle bun holes, the smell of cotton honey fills your nostrils, and you realize that they are coming in and out of the holes, not going somewhere else. So the you are about to collide with a buzzle bun who is also going into the exact same hole. Oh. You can either dive into the hole closer to you and uh, leave your your little friend Flitter to bop into the buzzle bun, or you can take the buzzle bun bop yourself. Uh, there's no way I would let Flitter get hit by a buzzle. They have stingers they that do. could really hurt it him. Zap I him. will turn. I try, try to turn, and hopefully I can just hit him with my back. I don't want to shoulder the poor little right. buzzle bun, make them all mad. Right. So you collide with the buzzle bun, tumble a little bit. He's fuzzy and vibrating, and you can tell he's very disoriented <laughs> as you both come up. It's much easier for you to gain your wits about you since you're this is flying. This is what you do. Right. He's kind of hop flying. Um, I, I'll try to write him. Like, I don't know if he's <laughs> On his little back and buzzing. Yeah, and he's and upset. He's like he's kind of roll, like rolling around on his back, like in a circle. Just bzzz. oh, that's so. Oh, if you so... flip him over and you want to ride him. Oh no, I meant ride him. Like get him up on this. Oh, like... ride him. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I can fly. I don't need to ride a buzzle bun. It, I mean, now I'm tempted, but I, <laughs> I think maybe I will only make the situation worse if I chose to ride the thing I just knocked over. So no, I will. I will yeah, no, you you flip it back. Him onto it. Flip it back over. Looks very upset. His little fuzzy nose crinkles, and he starts to sort of bop into your chest with a like little push like you're in the oh, way I, oh i'm in the oh and i i flit to the side there out of the way and yeah as gesture you, with a talon that way as you do that there's this huge deafening roar that rolls under your feet and across the valley and into this uh little outcropping that you're in all of the buzzle buns look s scared and pop back into their holes and it subsides, but some of the sugar on the ground starts to just tremble slightly still. What do you do? I look back at Flitter like, D you didn't do that, right? No, he didn't do that. Um, Covers his little mouth with his wings, like 
<laughs> shakes its little head. <laughs> <laughs> I like flitter. <laughs> I'll scrape up some sugar and um, taste it because it's really great. <laughs> Excellent. So the rumbles underneath the ground, flying up high would not give me a vantage point where this came from unless it traveled along the ground. Well, before that, since you just tasted a piece of the sugar, you're actually going to mark a shadow. Ooh. So something nefarious is going on here. And since you're eager to get into it, you actually just ate a piece of the darkness without knowing it. (sighs) What does it feel like when that happens? Expect this light confectionery sugar, but it actually was this like sickly sweet, almost like a sap, and it just slithered down uh, past my tongue, and and now I feel just a little sickish. Yeah. So now what would happen is you would mark a shadow, and I would say that you are going to mark angry. Okay. And that means that you can lash out at your friend Hachiro for either not giving you good advice or something. But this is something that you do because it's sort of a moment of weakness for you as you the shadow sort of consumes you for a moment. So what do you say to your friend? Or it could be to Flitter. Never Flitter. <laughs> Hachiro! That's what? Why did you say come down here? Look, I made nothing but a mess. And what was that roar? Some nature adept you are. Hachiro's frills flatten and raise, puts their head down to the ground and sort of schlumps up to you and nuzzles you a bit and says, I'm sorry. No, it's, it's, it's all right, Hachiro. We, we, just need, we need to fix this. Hachiro's head starts nodding furiously. Yes, yes. Where did that roar come from? Do you think that's what's stopping them? Can you talk to one of the buzzle buns? We need to know why we don't have enough of the cotton honey. Of course. Uh, after a moment, Hachira rushes down into the Buzzlebun hive and sort of disappears out of sight for a moment. Oh, well, I'll just, I'll just pet Flitter's head for a little bit. <laughs> uh, when they merge, Hachira says, seems like they're shutting everything down here. I tried to talk to the queen, but she's, she really wants to shut it all down. Like They're really scared of whatever's up on the, on the hill up there, and they say it's bad. Oh. That they have to leave. Well, no, t- tell them no. Tell them to wait for just a moment. We'll go see what's on the hill. Seems like we might have some time, but as Hachiro stops for a moment and goes, yes, I will stay here and work on getting them to, while you go to the scary cave. That sounds good. Really, Hachiro? Really? So you don't want any of the credit when we fix all of this? No, you're right. I like getting credit. <laughs> doesn't like credit sort of (laughs) stretches their wings and gets ready to trot after you up the hill to this big scary cave mouth where a waterfall of sand is descending upon it sort of eternally and looks kind of lovely but except for it looks sort of like a big gaping maw where this huge roar came from yeah that i think that cancels out the lovely Uh, (laughs) um hachiro hachiro don't eat the sugar by the way it tastes funky. Oh, okay. Let's do this. I'm going into the cave. Yeah, so... You can follow me. Um, Flitter, watch over Hachiro, because Hachiro's not as tough as you. Flitter puts its little wing on its hip, and it's like, mm, you want me to look after that? No, I'm with you. I go head first with you. <laughs> like, sort of starts making these little <laughs> chittery noises, like... <laughs> My own personal Woodstock. I love it. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm headed into the cave. We know where the bad thing is, and yeah. we'll go figure out what's going on. And as you get closer, you hear the song of another dragon, sort of a mantra that seems to be repeating. Quite lovely. What do you do? Do I know the words? How would you know? Are you Have you been to this part of Dragonia before? I haven't, but I do like songs. Cool. Maybe I'm cunning enough to figure something out? If you want, you can survey the ancient or arcane area here. Ooh, that sounds interesting. This cave is probably way older than anything else. So when you spend a moment to survey an ancient or arcane area, you get to roll plus cunning. And on a 10 plus, you get to ask a few questions. On a 7 to 9, you ask one less. Okay. What does it look like when you survey this cave? 
I imagine that the stalactites and the stalactite, uh, stalactites and the stalagmites all are different phosphorescent colors. Uh, so it looks like a multicolored rainbow of teeth, which should be scary, but it's interesting. And I think there are markings on some of them, talon marks, maybe. Hmm? Awesome. Yeah, roll it. Okay. My cunning is a zero because I'm a daredevil. So I got an eight, which means I get one question. Right. So your questions that you get to pick from are, what resources does this place offer? How can I gain access to this place's secrets? What here harbors darkness? Who else knows of this place? Or are we alone? I know we're not alone. (laughs) So I'm going with the question about the, the darkness. What was that question again? Yeah. What here harbors darkness? What here harbors darkness? Right. So as you're gracefully floating around the stalactites and stalagmites and sort of running your wingtip across it and your talon down the talon marks, you get the sense that the cave is mostly fine. Uh, It's very natural. And whatever's in here is not supposed to be in here is what you get the sense of. Mm. The chanting you feel is holding back something dark and that something dark is at the back of the cave and the song seems to be sort of like a cage around it. Oh, someone's using song magic to hold something back. So it must be a friend. Yeah. I'll go towards the song. I want to hear it. I want to see who's singing. So when you get to the song, you see this bug-eyed little dragon who's singing looks very tired like maybe they've been singing all day and you see a silver serpenty long tooth dragon so they're a good deal older than you popping back sitting on a giant heap of cotton honey and just dipping their claw through it and licking it clean like yes keep singing we've got still a ways to go before we're able to move this thing what do you do they haven't seen you yet the long tooth seems to is not singing, no, nope. right? Or the little one is singing. Oh, oh the little one is singing. Gotcha, gotcha. So I'm very two. tired. I'm coming up to the silver. What? Why are you making that one sing? Uh, Why don't you help? The serpent leaps up and coils itself around you and puts its fangs in your face and says, "What are you doing here? How dare you question me?" I'm here because. The Buzzle Buns won't make any more cotton honey. They're scared of whatever this thing is. What is it? The dragon uncurls around you a little bit and moves its head back to right in front of you and growls, leave. So now, if you don't leave, you'll be standing up to an older dragon. Would you like to stand up to this older dragon? I would like to stand up to the older dragon. Excellent. So when you do that, You get to roll plus courage, which you're great at. And on a hit, they acknowledge your worth and address your concerns. And you get to pick one from the list. I'm rolling now. Yeah, what does it look like when you... What do you say to this dragon? I I kind of puff myself up a little bit. And I try to meet my my eyes to his on the same level. He's he's a lot longer Mm -hmm. neck than I am. Uh, But I try to meet his gaze. And I don't look angrily. I try to look confident. I just meet his eyes because that's... That's what my clutch does. That's what we do. Yeah. And I've rolled a 10. You rolled a 10. That's awesome. You can, the first one is you delight them. They give you a useful item or gift or fancy gift. Second one is you impress them. They offer you a favor or accommodation. Or the third one, you intrigue them and they tell you something useful and interesting. I intrigue them. Awesome. So the serpent rolls their shoulders back and slithers back on top of their mound of cotton honey, drags its claw through it one more time and licks it clean with its little forked tongue Mm. and says, you're a feisty young one. You probably have great potential. Looks over at the little bug-eyed dragon who's singing and scoffs at, blows a little snort of smoke in its direction so it coughs as it's trying to sing. You know you could help us, uh keep this we're on a very important mission here Mm -hmm. we're trying to keep this beast caged here until we can transport it elsewhere you wouldn't happen to know how to sing would you well yes i can sing 
Well, and that's... then Flitter, Flitter shakes his head no. Like it totally ignores Flitter. Like it's not even worth the time of day. Like it could be a speck of dirt. So rude. And the <laughs> silver dragon says, "Well, that's good because." You see, my friend here is getting quite tired, and if this chant ever stops, the beast will be free, and we really can't have that. So that's your useful information, is what this this chant is. Mm -hmm. If it's interrupted, then whatever is caged back there won't be able to be caged any longer. I can help. Great. Hachiro, you can help too. Hachiro sort of furrows its little frilly brow. Uh... So sort of waddles up next to you and whispers in your ear and says, I don't, I don't know that this thing should be caged. It seems really upset, like it's in pain. And you know that they can hear the creatures of the wild, so. Uh, I thought, I thought that the shadow was being held within. Well, can you talk to it? Just shakes his head. It's, it's almost as if it's, in a language I don't understand, like it's a, a beast I've never encountered before. As you two are talking, the silver dragon sort of rolls back on its back and its shiny tummy is exposed, sort of rubs it for a moment. It says, yes, that's because it's a very, very rare ancient creature. We're just lucky enough to have it here. How do you know it's... It's a shadowy creature. What if it, if it's just different? Oh, that's not shadowy. It's just, it's very large and pretty and everyone will love it when it finally makes its way back to the capital and I deliver it into the hands of the director who is putting together the Moonbeam Festival. They won't have cotton honey, but they will have this. I don't think that's fair. You can't just enslave this thing. Snorts, enslave. It'll just be on display. I'm going to stop... I'm going to stop this one from singing and let it go. Ooh, how are you going to do that? I'll go tackle the one that's singing. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Uh, you're going to be acting despite danger again. Because... Okay. Uh, not because the little one. The little one is totally cut off guard. You are going to tackle it to pieces. But um, this silver dragon is not going to like, and you don't really know what's going to come after. So let's go ahead and have you act despite danger. And I am not trying to hurt the little one. I'm just no, basically tackling it and holding it. Some yeah. Okay. Oh, when I act despite danger, that's courage? Yeah. Okay. I uh, just rolled a six plus two, a seven. Awesome. Eight. So you're going to fumble, stumble, or embarrass yourself. This goes great. He's uh, he was already tired, <laughs> and uh, the dragon takes a big breath, and you barrel into him, and all that comes out is just <laughs> and <it laughs> flies backwards, and uh, sort of you tumble for a moment and uh, slide release, and he just kind of sits there panting for a moment <laughs> with a, its bug eyes, as if it could have gotten any buggier, but it seemed to have. Looks shocked and horrified, and dart over to the silver dragon who uh, is fleeing the cave, like just running, just galloping and then wings outstretched through the sand that's pouring down over the opening and leaving you all just as this big rumble comes over the cave again. It's deafening as you're actually inside the cave as this great beast roars and you turn to feel this hot, like, on the back of your neck. And there's mm -hmm. this giant horse creature with six legs and bat wings and a big horn is staring down at you. Oh. Hachiro, who has their wits about them for a moment, goes, uh, it's wing! And you see that under, on the bat wing, there's, like, this thick green goo that's sort of hurt and it's pulsing and dripping and as the drips hit the ground, it sort of sizzles into darkness. And you know the smell because you ate it earlier. And it sinks into the ground and disappears. Oh. So you can tell that the wound is festering and it's got some darkness in it. What do you do? 
we have to heal it. We ha- we've got to do something about that wound or this thing will go bad. It stomps two of its uh, right hooves at you <laughs> threateningly. How are you going to heal it? I would like to use some of that moon magic Yay! we talked about before. Excellent. Basically, you have all these friendship gems from your adventures and your friends have been super impressed with you and liked that you have played to their virtues. So we'll say you have three friendship gems okay. that you can add to your role. So you can add one or up to three, but that each one adds a plus one to your role. I'm going for broke here. Great. So you, return them, you return them to all of your friends and that gives you a plus three. So when you call upon the magic of the moons... You roll plus friendship gems returned. You get to uh, apply some if you get a really good roll. So what does it look like when you call upon the moons? Um, and which moon are you calling upon? What moons are there? <laughs> the moons you have are liberty, which is about purification and freedom. Spirit, which is about growth and healing. Stone, which is about protection and resilience. Storm, which is about force and chaos, and void, which is about negation and deflection. Spirit, awesome. by healing. Sounds great. So what does it look like when you call upon the spirit moon for help? I'm biting off of the whole Spyro look yeah. for Plus Sinistar. So I think that it's a deep purple and he has a pair of horns that kind of come back and over his little dragon neck there. And when he does it, he's, he kind of paws at the ground a couple times and the moon shines and somehow it bounces through. It's like it's daytime, but mm-hmm. the moon magic shines through the sand and it comes across all of the, uh, the stalactites and the stalagmites and the, and the moonbeams carry. <laughs> and that his horns just kind of glow like a moonlight, uh, like that off white moonlight there. And then he charges forward because he's going to headbutt the wound. Awesome. His plan. Yeah. So give it a roll. Okay, uh, here we go. I'm doing plus three, a 2d6. Oh, I rolled a five. Oh, but the plus three takes it up to an eight, so a mixed success. Right on. So with an eight, you get to pick one. So do you want the magic to be exceptionally powerful, or do you want it to remain within your control? If it remains within my control, then it will heal the beast? Yep. It just won't be particularly flashy. Okay, I'm okay with that. Excellent. I, I think headbutting the giant beast is enough flashiness for now. That is I will pretty keep good. Under my yeah. control. Flitter flitters out of the way quickly as it's sort of mesmerized by you calling upon the moon for a moment. It sort of mimics your stomping and excitement and then leaps back as you gallop forward and butt the wing. Sort of in slow motion, the um, Nargasus lowers its head and moves its neck to the side as it, it almost like feels you're threatening it, then realize it's you're not, and you pass by each other, and your head connects with its wound. A big flash of light fills the cave for everyone else. Um, and what does it feel like when this magic passes through you and heals the wing and, and banishes the darkness? Oh, well... You would think that it might hurt, right? I just slammed my head into a much bigger beast, but the magic carried me. And so there's this odd sense of euphoria, almost like that moment when you, when you're falling and you see where you're going and, and that fear passes through you and you have that moment of, I'm, I'm flying. And that's, that's what it feels like. Awesome. You sort of, Feel yourself again coming back down to earth as if almost as if you pass through the wing. But when you turn to face the beast again, it's at the entrance of the cave. And it sort of turns back to you and sort of lowers its head in a bow before marching through the sand and opening its bat wings, flexing the one that you fixed, pulling it back, flexing it again and then taking off. It's one of the most majestic sights you've ever seen as this rare, this is like a unicorn to dragons, right? Like (laughs) this thing is is a thing of lore and uh, it soars off in front of you. You totally just saved it from, from imprisonment and healed it from the darkness that was infecting it. All right. (laughs) 
Yeah, so now you would essentially get to talk to the buzzle buns, figure out how to deal with all the cotton honey delivery, if there's enough here, or if there needs to be help from the buzzle buns to kind of kick it into overtime or, or whatnot. But that would be what your quest was next. Fantastic. Wow, Marissa, that was so fun. Thank you so much for running a pillion for no, me. Thanks for having me and, and, and letting me run it for you. Cool. Well, thanks for coming on Plus One Four, Marissa. Uh, when you have another PBTA game come out, we'll, we'll yank you back on here. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Sounds great. Thank you. Hey, I wanted to take a minute of the podcast to talk about our brand new Patreon. Gauntlet has started a Patreon to help us not only to defray some of the costs of the podcast and the website and our Dropbox and our meetup, but also to help us grow. We want to continue to grow the community and so if you are interested in contributing, we would love to have your support. Uh, we'll, we'll take your non-monetary, of course, spread the word, help us out. Patreon.com forward slash gauntlet. If you back the $4 level at this Patreon, you get access to the Codex, which is our monthly zine. It's an RPG fanzine. And in that, we have had... Uh, campaign starters for Urban Shadows and The Sprawl will have other PBTA games. So I know you're a fan of PBTA stuff. This is a great place to get some of those. Also, if you want to play PBTA games, you can consider backing at $7 or more a month. And what that does, that gives you not only Codex, but you also get RSVP priority to the online games that we organize through Gauntlet Hangouts. I run games uh, every Saturday right now and also run every other Tuesday. Don't run any PBTA stuff on Tuesdays, but on Saturdays I'm almost always running PBTA stuff. I've run Apocalypse Rules 2nd Edition, Masks, Legend of the Elements, a lot of the stuff that you hear here, I'm trying to get that sucker to the table. Feel free to back at that level. And if you aren't able to contribute now, that's perfectly fine. If you are ready, willing, and able to do so, we thank you so much. Plus One Forward is a production of the Gauntlet community and Richard Rogers. You can find us on gauntlet-rpg.com or follow us on Twitter at gauntletrpg. The games mentioned on this show use the Apocalypse Engine, which is a creation of Vincent and McGay Baker. The music for Plus One Forward is from the Savage Arl Hotbed CD Gomi Daiko. The songs used are Gomi Daiko Metal Version and Process. You can find more amazing tunes by Savage Arl Hotbed on their website, savagearlhotbed.com.